Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology. This is lecture two of week three of the second term in our three term course series. We will be considering chapter 13 entitled The Peripheral Nervous System and Reflex Activity. In our last lecture, we considered a general introduction to the peripheral nervous system where we looked at sensory receptors and the structure of a nerve. Today, we'll continue the study of the peripheral nervous system beginning with our study of cranial nerves. We'll then return to the central nervous system to look at the spinal cord in association with chapter 12 before looking at the spinal nerves extending from the central nervous system. We'll close today's lecture by considering body innervation very briefly, followed by a quick discussion of reflex activity. Let's go ahead and get started. We've had a general discussion of nerves, including its microscopic anatomy, and now it's time to turn to our discussion of cranial nerves to begin our study of the peripheral nerves. We have 12 cranial nerves, and with the exception of the accessory nerve, they all originate on the inferior surface of the brain. They depart through various foramen of the skull and then infiltrate various parts of the body. Our cranial nerves are ordered numerically, anteriorly to posteriorly using Roman numerals, and they're named according to their function or by the structure by which they innervate. Most cranial nerves are mixed in function. They have some sensory as well as other motor activity. While we can generally identify cranial nerves as sensory or motor based, they can actually be further subdivided. And we see just some introduction to this this chapter, but next chapter when we look at the autonomic nervous system, we'll consider this a, a bit further. Sensory based cranial nerves can be somatic, meaning they pick up information from the skin, from our skeletal muscles and joints, or they might be visceral, meaning they deliver information to the brain via our visceral organs. Motor-based cranial nerves can be somatic, meaning messages are sent from the brain along to skeletal muscles, or motor-based cranial nerves can be autonomic, meaning messages are sent from the brain along to smooth muscles and glands. You're going to need to know the nerve type for each of the 12 cranial nerves. We begin with cranial nerve number one, the olfactory nerve, and this pair of nerves arises from the olfactory receptor cells of the nasal cavity, where they then pass through the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone, and all of the fibers eventually synapse to form olfactory bulbs, which terminate in the primary olfactory cortex region of the cerebral cortex found in the inferior part of our temporal lobe. The olfactory nerves are purely sensory in function, where they provide us our sense of smell. So this is cranial nerve number one, the olfactory nerves. Cranial nerve number two is our optic nerve pair. And the optic nerves arise from the retinas. They pass through their respective optic canals, where they converge and partially cross over at our optic chiasma. The optic tract then travels to the thalamus where it's then routed to the primary visual cortex. And what we find just like our olfactory nerve with cranial nerve number one, the optic nerves are also purely sensory in function where they provide our ability to see things. So this is cranial nerve two, our optic nerves. Cranial nerve number three is our oculomotor nerves. And these fibers extend from our ventral midbrain through the superior orbital fissures of the ocular orbit. The oculomotor nerve fibers are primarily motor based where they control some extrinsic eye muscles via the somatic motor pathway, as well as control lens shape and constrict the iris through the autonomic motor pathway. So this is motor based. Next, we have the trochlear nerves, cranial nerve number four. These nerve fibers extend from the more dorsal midbrain and enter the ocular orbits via the superior orbital fissures to innervate extrinsic eye muscles, just as we saw before with cranial nerve number three or oculomotor nerve. The trochlear nerve is a motor based nerve controlling one of our skeletal muscles that's responsible for moving our eyeball, the superior oblique muscle of the eyeball. And this is the most important eye muscle in helping move it in different directions. Cranial nerve five is the trigeminal nerve. The largest set of cranial nerves, the trigeminal nerve fibers extend from the more ventral lateral pons, so we're seeing this more ventral lateral region, to the face. And in doing so, it ends up branching into three divisions, thus the idea of tri for trigeminal. And so we're going to see those divisions here, superior, middle, and inferior branches. 
The more superior branch is called the ophthalmic nerve and it passes through the superior orbital fissure. We have the maxillary nerve which passes through the foramen rotundum and we have the mandibular nerve that passes through the foramen ovale. So we have three branches of our trigeminal nerve. And the trigeminal nerve is a mixed nerve with both sensory as well as motor fibers. It's going to be responsible for conducting sensory impulses from various areas of the face, as well as it supplies motor fibers necessary for mastication. Cranial nerve number six is the abducens nerve, and it extends from the more inferior pons, so we're going to see that here more inferiorly, serpons, and it's going to enter the orbits of the eye through, again, the superior orbital fissure. So this is our third cranial nerve responsible for innervation of the eyeball in response to skeletal muscle control. The cranial nerve is primarily motor-based, whereby it innervates what we call the lateral rectus muscle, that skeletal muscle of the eyeball that helps move our eye. Again, this is cranial nerve number six, the abducens nerve. Cranial nerve number seven is our facial nerve, and so we're going to see facial nerve here. It's going to extend from the pons in this lateral position, this more inferior lateral position. It then is going to travel through the internal acoustic meatus, which is shared with the vestibular cochlear nerve, cranial nerve eight of our temporal bone, to the more lateral aspects of the face. So we're looking at more lateral aspects here. We have five branches of the facial nerve. And those branches are going to represent the major motor nerves of the face, innervating facial muscles to allow us to have various facial expressions. The five branches include what we call the temporal, the zygomatic, the buccal, the mandibular, and a cervical branch. So five branches of our facial nerve. The facial nerve is a mixed nerve with many different fiber types. It's sensory in nature where it provides for taste with the anterior two thirds of the tongue. So we'll see that when we go to chapter 15. It serves a motor function in the control of facial expression and it further controls impulses routed to the lacrimal glands of the eye and to some of our sublingual submandibular glands of the mouth. So we see various different activities with the facial nerve. Again, this is cranial nerve seven, the facial nerve. Cranial nerve number eight is the vestibular cochlear nerve. And this cranial nerve has two parts, a cochlear region, which helps with hearing, as well as the vestibular region, which aids in equilibrium, together helping us keep our orientation in space for balance while helping us hear. The vestibular cochlear nerve is a mixed nerve. It's mostly sensory in function, but it has a motor component in association with the muscles of the middle ear holding our auditory ossicles to prevent sound damage with loud noise. Cranial nerve number nine is our glossopharyngeal nerve, and these nerve fibers are going to extend from, we're going to see medulla oblongata here. They're going to leave the skull via our jugular foramen. This is the first nerve that leaves the skull, and it runs along the throat. The glossopharyngeal nerve fibers have mixed function, so serving as a motor function, this nerve innervates part of the tongue and the pharynx to help with swallowing while also providing some parasympathetic fibers to our parotid salivary glands. Serving in a sensory function, the glossopharyngeal nerve fibers conduct taste and general sensory impulses from the pharynx, as well as the posterior third of the tongue, as well as sends impulses from baroreceptors regarding blood pressure and the carotid sinuses, and chemoreceptors of the carotid body, which monitors oxygen and carbon dioxide levels in the blood. So this cranial nerve number nine, the glossopharyngeal nerve, has a significant number of activities and is mixed in function. Cranial nerve number 10 is the vagus nerve, and this pair of nerves is the only pair of cranial nerves that extends beyond the head and neck region. Fibers extend from our medulla oblongata, and I didn't have um, an image that we see here, so I've just included uh, this particular image. And so again, we're going to see fibers extend from the medulla oblongata, so the most inferior part of our brainstem, and is going to exit the skull via our jugular foramen, then descend through the neck, to the heart, to the lungs of the thoracic cavity, as well as to the abdominal cavity. The vagus nerve is mixed function nerve, and its motor functions, we see parasympathetic in nature, regulating activities of the heart, 
the lungs, and the visceral organs. In contrast, the vagus nerve also has a sensory function, for it provides sensory input from visceral organs, from baroreceptors and chemoreceptors, and from the taste buds of the posterior tongue, the epiglottis, and the pharynx. Our next nerve is cranial nerve number 11. This is the accessory nerve. And this pair of nerves is unique in that it forms from rootlets associated with the spinal cord, not directly from the brain, but we still call it a cranial nerve. Accessory nerves first ascend upward, enter the cranium via our foramen magnum, then exit the skull via the jugular foramen, where they ultimately innervate our trapezius muscle. Think about those muscles that help us shrug our shoulders and the sternocleidomastoid muscles of the neck, helping us shake our head yes and no, as well as helping as an accessory organ for breathing. The accessory nerves are primarily motor-based, but we do say they have some sensory function. So we are going to say the nerve type is both. They supply motor fibers to the two neck muscles, and while our textbook doesn't mention it, the accessory nerve should have some sensory function as well in providing proprioceptor impulses back to the central nervous system. So although our textbook indicates that the nerve type is primarily motor-based, I want you to know this is having mixed function. And if I ask this on an exam, you should say cranial nerve number 11 is mixed function. Now this is going to take us to cranial nerve number 12, our hypoglossal nerve. And this set of nerves extends from the medulla oblongata. It exits the skull via our hypoglossal canal before serving the tongue. Just like cranial nerve number 11, this nerve is primarily motor-based. It's going to innervate both extrinsic and intrinsic muscles of the tongue. It helps contribute to swallowing and speech. But the textbook doesn't mention any sensory function, and I want you to understand that there is a sensory function to this. So this is going to be considered a mixed nerve, just like cranial nerve number 11. There's some sensory function where this set of nerves conveys proprioceptor information about the tongue back to the brain. So if I ask you this on an exam, is this sensory, motor, or both? You would say both, and this is a mixed nerve, just like cranial nerve number 11. And so that's it. That's the 12 cranial nerves. Now one follow-up, the textbook gives us a mnemonic device to help you in your studies to determine which cranial nerves are sensory, which are motor, and which serve both. Now, their textbook example, some say merry money, but my brother says big brains matter more. That is what the textbook says. However, I have given you different information for cranial nerve number eight, 11, and 12. So I've made adjustments and I expect you to know those adjustments. So according to the textbook, cranial nerve number eight is primarily sensory. I'm telling you both. And so we should say cranial nerve number eight, which would be represented by says, I would like you to know that is a mixed motor nerve. So we have both. And so I've substituted broadcasts for says. Also with regards to cranial nerves number 11 and 12, the two M's at the end for the textbook example. I've made note that there's some sensory function involved with our last two cranial nerves, accessory nerve and hypoglossal nerve. The textbook mnemonic device puts these last two cranial nerves in the motor only category, but we should go ahead and consider it both sensory and motor. This is, these are mixed nerves, so you should replace that uh, mnemonic with our 11th and 12th words. So some say merry money, but my brother broadcasts big brains before bliss. This is how you should remember our 12 cranial nerves in terms of being sensory, motor, or both. Last week, you probably noticed I skipped the last part of chapter 12, so that section 12.10, and 12.11 of the 11th edition textbook and the study of our spinal cord. So we're going to return to chapter 12 now and the study of the spinal cord and then pick that up with the study of spinal nerves tied with this chapter in 13. The spinal cord consists of nerve cells, nerve fibers, nerve tracts, all enabling it to function as the major pathway for the conduction of information between the external environment and the central nervous system. Specifically, the spinal cord has ascending nerve tracts that bring information to various brain centers from the periphery, as well as has descending nerve tracts 
to send instructions back out to vessels, to glands, to our muscles of the body after integration of information at the brain. In addition, the spinal cord can act as an integrating center itself. We'll see that just in glimpse with spinal reflexes, which are the rapid response to a change in the environment initiated and completed at the spinal cord level rather than being routed to higher brain levels for integration. So as we look at the gross anatomy of the spinal cord, we recognize if we look at this section here, we would see brain stem up here with the medulla oblongata converting thin material into our spinal cord. We're going to see somewhat of an oval shaped structure if we take a cross section and it begins superiorly at the foramen magnum and it's contained within the vertebral canal of our vertebrae until it ends inferiorly, somewhere around L1 through L3. There are five regions of the spinal cord. We have a cervical region, a thoracic region, we have a lumbar region, we have a sacral region, and at the very end, we have this very short cosageal region. Now these regions shouldn't be new to you, in fact, we learn these regions generally when we studied bones during our first term of anatomy and physiology. One thing I want to point out now, as our spinal cord generally is cylindrically shaped or somewhat oval shaped as it moves inferiorly, it's not uniform in diameter throughout its length. In fact, superiorly, right in this region of our cervical region, we're going to see what's called a cervical enlargement. And this is where the nerves from the region innervate the skin and the muscles of our upper extremities. So we see a lot of extra information coming in here at this region, given our upper appendages. We also see the same thing in our lumbar region. So we're going to see a lumbar enlargement. And that's going to contain the nerves from this region that innervate our lower extremities or appendages. Now, within the thoracic spinal cord region, we don't see any enlargements, but we will see gradually as we continue our studies, there are some unique components to our thoracic region. In our study last term, we learned that the spinal cord proper ended somewhere around the L1 through L3 region, branching into what we call the cauda equina. With this formal termination in the lumbar region, the spinal cord narrows to this cone-shaped terminal portion we call the conus medullaris. So here's where the spinal cord formal is going to terminate at that conus medullaris. And then arising from this terminus is what we call the phylum terminale. And so we're going to see some connective tissue extend from the pia mater that anchors the spinal cord or that conus medullaris of the spinal cord all the way down here to the cossacks. These images are images taken from our PAL site, and so you might see these images on your upcoming lab exam. This is also an image from the PAL site showing the various components I mentioned in the last slide. So here is our cone-shaped conus medullaris. We're going to see the phylum terminale run inferiorly to connect to our cossacks. And then finally, this material here, we see our cauda equina, by which we have fibers extending from the very terminal end of our spinal cord. I'd like to now turn to spinal cord surface anatomy. We have two prominent grooves running the length of the spinal cord as we consider the cross section of the spinal cord. And so if we position ourselves here, we're dorsal, here's ventral, we're going to see that we have this posterior median sulcus, a shallow groove found on the posterior or dorsal surface of the spinal cord, and then we're going to see here an anterior median fissure, a deeper groove on the anterior or the ventral surface of the spinal cord. Recall when we studied the surface of the brain in an earlier chapter, the sulcus is more of a shallow groove, fissures are deeper grooves, and together these grooves help differentiate not only the two anterior and posterior surfaces, but then also help us differentiate left and right sides of the spinal cord. As we saw with the brain in chapter 12, the spinal cord is also carefully protected. In addition to the bones of the vertebrae and the cushion environment created by cerebrospinal fluid, the spinal cord has connective tissue meninges enclosing it from the foramen magnum all the way down to the sacrum. Now let's go ahead and look at a cross section here of the spinal cord to identify all the tissues and spaces. First, we're going to have what's called an epidural space. This is the area between the dura mater and the vertebral wall, which contains fat and some small blood vessels, helping provide a protective padding around the spinal cord. 
moving deeper now if we're moving deeper here we've we've seen our epidural space now we see these structures here we have our spinal dura mater and similar to the cranial dura mater we have a periosteal layer as well as a meningeal layer next we have another potential space we call this our subdural space which we see here and here between our spinal dura mater and the next meningeal layer we call our spinal arachnoid matter Continuing deeper to the spinal arachnoid matter, this is our second meningeal layer, which lies under the dura mater, and it consists of connective tissue. It's somewhat avascular. It's not innervated. Now, unsurprisingly, we have yet another space deep to the arachnoid matter called the subarachnoid space. And this is where we see our cerebral spinal fluid as it flows from the fourth ventricle of the brain. Finally, we have what's called spinal pia matter. And so we're going to see that resting right on the surface of our spinal cord. This pia matter is similar to how it's found in the brain. It's a very delicate layer. It adheres to the surface of the spinal cord and the roots coming off of the spinal nerves. Along the length of our spinal cord, pia matter exhibits these extensions between spinal nerve roots that we call denticulate ligaments. And so we're going to see a denticulate ligament here. This is our pia matter and this is going to be an extension of our pia matter here and here these structures that we call ligaments help suspend and secure the spinal cord to the middle of our dural sheath along the entire length of the spinal cord and so this adds to the function of our phylum terminale in securing our spinal cord in place so these are our denticulate ligaments in this slide, we're going to look at some cross sections taken from various regions along the spinal cord with images that are all at similar magnification. So these images all look different size, but they are the same or very similar in magnification. And so I'm showing you this so that you may compare the relative amounts of gray matter and white matter at each level of the spinal cord, as well as understand how the diameter changes. And remember, diameter changes somewhat with regards to those cervical and lumbar enlargements associated with upper and lower limbs. But also remember, as information progresses upward from throughout the body, we continue to collect more and more fibers. And so it's also natural that we should have a slightly larger diameter up top as compared to down low. As we look at these images, the first thing I want to mention is the staining process for the spinal cord leaves our colors reversed. In this staining process, we're going to see white matter actually appears darkly stained, which this is white matter. This here is our gray matter, and it's going to appear lightly stained. We now turn to another cross section of the spinal cord to consider some additional terminology where we have white matter and gray matter, both terms we just looked at in the last slide, as well as we're going to see the gray commissure and central canal. So let's look at these terms individually. First, we have white matter. And so we see that white matter here, 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 kind of on the, the more superficial part of our spinal cord. Recall from the last slide, white matter consists of bundles of myelinated nerve fibers conducting impulses within the central nervous system. In the spinal cord, our white matter involves millions of longitudinally oriented fibers organized in these tracts. We also have gray matter, so more deep, we're going to see our gray matter, and some say it looks a little like a butterfly or like the letter H. Gray matter represents a collection of neuron cell bodies within the central nervous system. So we're going to see synapsing here at these cell bodies. We also have the gray commissure. So the gray commissure is found right here, and that's going to refer to a bundle of fibers, so a bundle of nerve fibers that crosses from right side to left side of the central nervous system, or left to the right. Ultimately, commissures connect the two halves so as to allow communication between the halves. And we actually saw the term commissure already this term where we saw connection between left hemisphere and right hemisphere of the brain where we looked at our corpus callosum. Finally, we have our central canal, which is real hard to see right there, but the central canal, sometimes referred to as the spinal foramen or the ependymal canal, it's a longitudinal tube, it's hollow, it's filled with cerebrospinal fluid, and it runs the entire length of the spinal cord. It actually extends inferiorly from the fourth ventricle of the brain and ends at the cornus medullaris, 
at the distal end of the spinal cord. Looking at this cross section of our spinal cord, we see gray matter here, we're going to see our white matter here, and now we can go ahead and look at the different parts of gray matter. So if we look at the posterior or dorsal side or closest to, we're going to see what we call posterior gray horns. So those are found here and here. They're composed of gray matter extending toward our posterior or dorsal region of the spinal cord. And we're ultimately going to find that as we look at the posterior part of the spinal cord, this is the part responsible for processing of sensory information coming into the central nervous system. We also have lateral gray horns, or at least we have them when we're looking at the thoracic region. Our lateral gray horns are found only in that thoracic region as well as slightly into the superior lumbar region of the spine. And it's going to be involved with sympathetic innervation. So we're looking at the sympathetic division of our autonomic nervous system and the topic of chapter 14 or part of the topic of chapter 14 when we consider our lateral gray horn. So cervical region and the more inferior part um, leading up to the conus medullaris is not going to have those lateral gray horns. Finally, we have our anterior gray horns here and here. These horns represent the gray matter that extends toward the anterior or ventral surface or region of the spinal cord. And we'll see that this area is the part responsible for sending out motor signals to our skeletal muscles. In addition to the posterior, lateral, and anterior gray horns, we also have what are called posterior, lateral, and anterior columns, or sometimes they're called funiculi. And so we're seeing those columns here and here. These are our laterals. This is the posterior, and here we have our anterior white columns. These regions of the spinal cord, these columns, contain myelinated as well as some unmyelinated nerve fibers and represent ascending tracts of the nervous system, fibers carrying sensory information up to the brain, as well as descending tracts carrying motor commands from the brain to our effectors. To identify them, use your knowledge of the gray horns to help you. So here we had our posterior gray horn, posterior gray horn, now here we have our posterior columns, lateral columns, and then here we have our anterior horns, gray horns, and we have those anterior columns. This image here, we see our posterior white columns found between our posterior gray horns. Then we'll see our lateral columns followed by our anterior white columns. Now that we understand the spinal cord's internal anatomy, let's take a look at the spinal nerves associated with the spinal cord. So now we're moving into peripheral nervous system again. Generally, each spinal nerve is connected to the spinal cord by a root composed of both sensory fibers and motor fibers. So it's a misnomer to say that we see nerves extending directly from the spinal cord we actually see a pair of roots on either side, which will ultimately come together to create a spinal nerve. So we see dorsal root here, dorsal root, this is the posterior dorsal side. We'll see our ventral root here and here. Let's go ahead and begin with our dorsal or posterior root. So found here, this is going to be composed of afferent fibers. These are sensory fibers carrying impulses from receptors in the periphery to our central nervous system. So we see information traveling this way. We also have here what's called a dorsal root ganglion. And re remember that ganglia are collections of neuron cell bodies found outside the central nervous system. And so these enlargements here and here contain the cell bodies of sensory neurons involved in sensory perception. And so we see a very long fiber by which we have then the ganglion, that cell body, followed by a short fiber, which synapses then with another neuron here. Turning to our ventral side of the spinal cord, we have what are called ventral or anterior roots. The ventral root is composed of efferent fibers. So we have motor fibers, which carry impulses from the brain to our effector organs. And so you see that arrow by which information will be directed this way out of the spinal cord, gradually to the spinal nerves and, and beyond. Lastly, we have the spinal nerve itself. So we just have a little piece of our spinal nerve here as well as here. And this is formed more laterally where both the dorsal and ventral roots merge to form a single mixed spinal nerve. Now, before moving on, I wanna point out a significant nuance. On the whole, 
the posterior or dorsal region of the spinal cord is responsible for sensory functions. So we see information traveling in, we would see information traveling in here, whereas the anterior or ventral regions are associated with motor function, sending information out or sending information out. Keep this in mind as we proceed forward in our studies. Spinal nerves pass through what's called intervertebral foramen, the doorway between the spinal canal and the periphery. And these foramen lie between the pedicles of neighboring vertebrae at all levels of the spine. So after passing through the intervertebral foramen, each spinal nerve then is going to divide. So we start with roots, dorsal, ventral, we join together to create the mixed spinal nerve, but then we're going to separate again very soon. So we're going to see that the spinal nerve is going to divide into two major branches and two smaller branches. Right now I wanna focus on dorsal ramus and ventral ramus. We'll talk about the rame communicanes in another lecture. So here we're going to see this is our ventral root by which we create spinal nerve. This is our dorsal root by which we create spinal nerve. And now quickly we're going to see a spinal nerve is going to branch into the dorsal ramus as well as branch to the ventral ramus. Now what's the significance of that? Well if you look over here and you see the ventral ramus, the ventral ramus of each spinal nerve passes laterally and innervates the muscles and the skin on the anterior lateral side of the body and the limbs, so the front and the sides. Generally, the ventral ramus is thicker in diameter than the dorsal ramus because it innervates a much larger area of the body than our dorsal ramus. And if we look at our dorsal ramus here, so this was our ventral ramus that's going to innervate the anterior lateral side, but now we're looking at dorsal ramus, this is going to innervate the skin and muscles of the posterior neck, the back, and the trunk. Now, if you're curious about the rami communicanes here, which we're going to see as another branch, this is the branch off spinal nerves by which we see the autonomic fibers innervating certain thoracic and abdominal organs. So this becomes material for chapter 14. This slide provides us with a superior view looking down inferiorly where we can see the dorsal root here by which sensory information comes in. The ventral root here, if we're looking at the green pathway, we're going to see ventral root here sending out motor information. We do see pink representing information associated with our autonomic nervous system. Again, the topic for chapter 14. This is some helpful information that the textbook provides when we look at roots and rami. Note that our roots are either motor or sensory. Our ventral root is going to be motor, our dorsal root is sensory. But when we look at rami, rami are both motor and sensory. So our rami, so we create the roots off of the spinal cord, we create spinal nerve, and then we see branching. The rami, those branches from the spinal nerve, are going to be both motor and sensory from the various areas of the body, ventrally or anterolaterally. Up through now, we've talked about various parts of the nervous system as individual units. We've learned about sensory receptors that pick up stimuli from environment, as well as we discussed the responsibilities of the various sensory areas of the cerebral cortex. We also talked about the cerebellum, interpreting signals sent by sensory receptors from the periphery to help us with our balance and equilibrium, both consciously as well as subconsciously. Now what I want to do is put all of these components together. And so to do so, we need to look at what are called ascending pathways to the brain, the pathways responsible for relaying information from the body's sensory receptors of the periphery and along to the primary somatosensory area of the cerebral cortex or potentially directly to the cerebellum. But we also have descending pathways. We certainly see information beginning in our central nervous system, moving down the spinal cord out to our effectors. I will say this chapter, I spend more of my time addressing the ascending pathways as compared to the descending pathways, but just recognize that there are both along this track. Now, as we consider these pathways, there are some terms to remember. First, we have the term decusation. Recall last chapter. This simply means pathways cross from one side of the central nervous system to the other. For instance, information collected by sensory receptors from the right side of the body ultimately cross over the medulla oblongata to travel to the left hemisphere. 
whereas information collected from sensory receptors of the left side of the body cross over at the medulla oblongata to travel to the right hemisphere. That point of crossing over is the decussation point. We also have the term relay, which is simply a chain of neurons. And we're going to see in another slide, I think it's the next one actually, the concept of a relay where we look at first order, second order, and sometimes third order neurons. Finally, we have the term symmetry, which simply means pathways and tracks are paired on either side of the spinal cord, ultimately crossing over one another to decussate before being routed to the cerebral hemispheres or to the cerebellum. To understand these pathways, let's take a look at this image right here. Generally, we find that we have three neurons involved in the transfer of information from the periphery to our cerebral cortex, sometimes just two neurons when information is being directed to the cerebellum. But if we're talking about information from the periphery to our cerebral cortex, we have three neurons involved. We call those first order, second order, and third order neurons. Now our first order neurons, our cell bodies of first order neurons reside in the dorsal root ganglion or potentially in the cranial nerve ganglion, and deliver sensory impulses to the gateway of our central nervous system, that is to the spinal cord or to the brainstem. We see those first order neurons here, by which again, we're at the periphery and we are going to synapse right at the spinal cord or potentially the brainstem. Then we have second order neurons. The cell bodies of second order neurons may be located in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord or in the medulla oblongata of our brainstem, and they're going to transmit impulses to the thalamus. So right where our first order neuron synapse, now we're looking at second order neuron to the thalamus. Now this second order neuron may go directly to the cerebellum where that's the end of the story, but let's continue to see what happens to get information to the cerebral cortex. That third order neuron, it's going to be located in the thalamus. Remember, our thalamus is our relay station. And so for those tracts that end in the cerebrum, third order neurons conduct impulses from the thalamus to a given sensory area of the cerebral cortex. So this is our ascending pathway to the brain by which we're looking at a first order, second order, and third order neuron is as long as we're moving to the cerebrum. But again, if we're moving to the cerebellum, we may only see these first two neurons. Depending on the sensory receptor and sense modality, our neuron chains may create one of three different ascending pathways to the sensory areas of our cerebral cortex or along to the cerebellum. We have what are called dorsal column medial lemniscal pathways, we have a spinothalmic pathway, and we have a spinocerebellar pathway. Let's go ahead and take a look at each of the three pathways by beginning with our dorsal column lemniscal pathway. Now, in terms of this pathway, the dorsal column medial lemniscal pathway, it's such a mouthful, is responsible for the relay of nerve impulses associated with conscious proprioception, as well as several highly evolved and refined sensations like fine touch, stereognosis, the, or the ability to recognize the size, the shape, and the texture of an object by feeling it by proprioception or the awareness of our precise position of our body parts and kinesthesia or the awareness of directions of movement. It can also pick up vibratory sensations. The pathway involved is so named based on the names of the two white matter tracks that convey the impulses to our cerebral cortex. The primary one involves the dorsal column of the spinal cord. So we know what our dorsal column looks like as we're looking at our spinal cord here. So here's our dorsal or our posterior surface here but also another component we haven't discussed called the medial lemniscus of the brainstem. I don't wanna to focus too much on this, but just recognize what information is transported via this dorsal column medial lemniscal pathway. The second ascending pathway is our spinothalamic pathway. This pathway, sometimes called the anterolateral pathway, relays impulses associated with pain, with temperature, with tickle and itch, as well as some touch and pressure along to our cerebral cortex. Like the dorsal column medial lemniscal pathway, the spinothalamic pathway is composed of a set of three neurons. And again, I'm not so concerned about you recognizing 
where these three neurons are going to synapse here and here. So we have our first order neuron, second order neuron, third order neuron. But I want you to understand the function of this ascending pathway. Our third ascending pathway is the spinocerebellar pathway. It's a little different than the other two we've talked about up through now. Specifically, the spinocerebellar pathway is one whereby proprioceptive impulses travel to the cerebellum. And as it pertains to the cerebellum, perception isn't conscious. Sensory impulses conveyed to the cerebellum are involved in unconscious perception, such as found associated with our posture or our balance and the coordination of skilled movements. So what I want you to really understand here, again, not so concerned about the pathway itself, but more so the function and where it's going. We are heading to the cerebellum here rather than our cerebral cortex. Now that we've concluded our discussion on the three ascending pathways, I'd like to return to chapter 13. We understand the spinal cord in some detail now associated with chapter 12. Let's go ahead and consider the spinal nerves that branch from the spinal cord. The spinal cord is associated with 31 spinal nerves and they're all identified based on their association to the vertebral column. We have cervical nerves, thoracic spinal nerves, lumbar, sacral, and cosageal spinal nerves. And the numbering of each spinal nerve, other than the cervical nerves, corresponds to the vertebra above the exit from the vertebral column. That is to say, except for the cervical spinal nerves, the nerve exits inferior to its respective vertebra. With regard to cervical nerves, we actually have eight of them. Of course, we only have seven vertebrae associated with the spinal region, but we have eight spinal nerves. C1 is going to leave the spinal cord above the C1 vertebra, and thus we see that move between the occipital bone and the first cervical vertebra, which, that, which in that manner gives us the opportunity to have eight spinal nerves associated with the cervical region. Recall with our spinal nerves, as we begin with an extension from the spinal cord, we see dorsal roots and ventral roots that branch off the spinal cord, and only as those come together, we create a spinal nerve. So don't forget that as we're moving forward, here's our dorsal root, here's our ventral root, by which they merge together to create our spinal nerve. Now, understanding the spinal nerves is only half the picture of understanding how spinal nerves actually innervate the body. In fact, we also need to study the plexus system. A nerve plexus is a complex network of intersecting nerves that distribute sensory and motor fibers throughout the body. Such networks help further control muscle movements and coordinate actions while also enhancing sensory function. So here are our five plexus systems, cervical, brachial, lumbar, sacral, and cosageal. Beginning with the cervical plexus, and so here we're looking at the cervical plexus. The cervical plexus is formed by the ventral rami of spinal nerves C1 through C4 with some contribution of C5. This plexus innervates skin and muscles of the neck, the ear, the back of the head, parts of our shoulders and our chest. One nerve to note here in terms of special nerves or important nerves, we have the phrenic nerve. This is the major motor and sensory nerve of our diaphragm. Here, we're going to see our brachial plexus. And so this plexus is formed by the ventral rami of spinal nerves C5 through 8, as well as T1. Sometimes we might see C4 or T2 also contributing. This plexus ultimately gives rise to the nerves that innervate our shoulders and our upper limbs. And we have three branches by which we're going to see here, one, two, three. And these include our axillary nerve, which helps provide motor innervation to our deltoid muscles and to the teres minor muscle of the shoulder to support shoulder abduction and external rotation. We have the radial nerve. So if we look at our radial nerve, this is our nerve in green, that's going to travel down the arm. It's going to branch into various nerves to support the forearm and the hand. It innervates our triceps brachii. It helps extend the elbow. That's what the function of the triceps brachii does, as well as it helps supply some of our extensor muscles of the forearm and contributes to the extension of our wrist 
and provides for some of our fine motor function of our hand. Finally, the radial nerve ultimately helps ensure the forearm can supinate or that idea that palms face upward. Lastly, we have our ulnar nerve, which we're going to see here. That ulnar nerve is another branch from the brachial plexus and it's involved in fine motor skills and hand grip. It plays a role in hand dexterity and coordination. In this slide, we see our lumbar plexus. So here we're looking at the lumbar region. This plexus arises from contributions from our spinal nerves L1 through L4, and it innervates the anterolateral thigh, the abdominal wall, and some of our external genitalia. The femoral nerve is one major nerve to note that arises from this lumbar plexus where it innervates the quadriceps. So remember the quadriceps muscles included the rectus femoris, vastus lateralis, vastus medialis, and vastus intermedius, thus responsible for extending the knee joint. And it also helps innervate our sartorius muscle, which is involved in hip flexion as well as hip abduction. Here we're going to see our sacral plexus. So this region here, and you see our hip here, this is going to be our sacrum. This plexus arises from spinal nerves L4 through S4, and it serves by innervating the posterior thigh, including the buttocks, some pelvic structures, and our perineum. One nerve to note branching from the sacral plexus is the sciatic nerve. It's the longest and the thickest nerve in our body. It innervates the hamstrings. So now we're thinking of the biceps femoris, the semimembranosus, and the semitendinosus, all of which are responsible for flexing the knee. And it also innervates some of our gluteal muscles, thus helping with hip abduction. Finally, it can provide some motor innervation to muscles of our pelvic floor, which can in some way assist with bladder and bowel control, as well as sexual function. Finally, we have the cosageal plexus. This plexus arises from spinal nerves S4 through S5 plus our cosageal spinal nerve, which we just call CO1, and it innervates just a very small area of skin in the cosageal region surrounding our tailbone. And so here is that plexus that we find with S4 through C1. We've looked at the various plexuses associated with the spinal nerve regions, but we've left off one important region of spinal nerves, our thoracic spinal nerves, and specifically spinal nerves T2 through T12. So what's the deal with these spinal nerves? Well, these spinal nerves don't form a plexus, but rather they depart the spinal cord to form our intercostal nerve. So inter between and costal ribs. So we're looking at nerves between the ribs and that's part of the story. Some of these nerves fit within the groove between each rib where they provide some somatic motor output to innervate the intercostal muscles that help us with our breathing. Others are going to innervate the anterolateral abdominal muscles. Recall this is our external and internal oblique groups, the rectus abdominis, as well as the transverse abdominis. These fibers are also going to have a somatic sensory role where they innervate the skin of the back and the torso to provide for sensory reception. As the skin covers our entire body, it's supplied by somatic sensory neurons that carry nerve impulses from the skin into the spinal cord up toward our more superior central nervous system. The dorsal roots of each of our 31 spinal nerves contain sensory neurons that serve a specific predictable segment of our skin. And these segments of our skin we call dermatomes. The dorsal roots of each of our 31 spinal nerves contain sensory neurons that serve as a very specific predictable segment of skin. And these segments we call dermatomes. Because each segment of the spinal cord innervates a different region of the body, dermatomes can be used to precisely map the surface of the body such that a loss of sensation in a particular region is going to be tied to a dermatome, which can indicate the exact level of spinal cord damage. So here, if we look at this ventral surface of the body and the dorsal surface of the body, we're seeing here, for instance, we're looking, actually, let's, um, let's look down here. We're looking at our second thoracic uh, spinal nerve is going to ultimately be responsible for that sensation in this part of our arm. We're seeing lumbar region here is associated with the sensation L2, L3, L4, L5. 
we'll see L5 is going to be responsible for sensation all the way to most of our toes with S1 going to be responsible for the lateral part of our lower limb and our smallest toe. And then this is the back of the body by which we see those sensations associated with various different spinal nerves. Finally, in regard to the last topic of chapter 13 in the peripheral nervous system, I want to briefly discuss reflex activities. Now, to do so, I'm going to discuss a scenario. Let's imagine you're outside and you hear someone yell, duck! It doesn't matter where you are or what you're doing. You immediately hunch over and cover your head. Maybe it's to avoid an oncoming baseball. Maybe it's to avoid one of those red rubber balls used on the playground for dodgeball. Maybe it's even to avoid bird droppings when a group of seagulls takes off on the beach and flies overhead. But no matter, under these conditions, that idea of duck, it seems our body responds with superhuman speed and we duck like our life depends on it. These rapid automatic responses are what we call reflexes. And quite simply, reflexes are just our body's way of getting out of a potentially dangerous situation quickly. Specifically, a reflex is defined as a rapid, involuntary, pre-programmed response that activates muscles or glands to help us avoid tissue damage. And reflexes are fast. That's because our body has found a way to bypass our brain for a more immediate self-rescue. So a reflex involves a site of a stimulus where a receptor can be found. The information travels to the integration center, which in this case isn't the brain, but in fact is the spinal cord. Then it heads straight back out via an efferent pathway to the periphery so as to help us avoid some kind of scenario. This process consists of the five components listed here, sensory receptor, a sensory neuron, integration center, motor neuron, and the effector. Let's discuss these components in a little more detail, starting with our receptor. So the sensory receptor is a nerve ending sensitive to physical or chemical changes in our environment. And once stimulated, the receptor initiates a message via its sensory neuron to an integration center in the central nervous system. For many reflexes, that integration center is simply the spinal cord, in contrast to the brain being the integration center for most of the sensory receptors we've studied to date. The next component of this reflex is the motor, is the sensory neuron, which relays impulses triggered by the integration center out of the central nervous system to an effector. The next component of the reflex arc is our motor neuron. So we've sent information to the central nervous system. In this case, we, we find integration at the spinal cord. Now, we've made some decision at the spinal cord level of what needs to happen with our body. So we are going to then rely on a motor neuron, which relays impulses triggered by our integration center out of the central nervous system, out to the periphery to an effector. And the effector itself depends on what response is needed in the case of the duck and cover situation, the effector is a group of muscles allowing us to pull our arms up and over our head and crouch our torso down. We're protecting the important parts of our body. Now that we've discussed the five components of the reflex arc, let's go ahead and look at how reflexes may be categorized. And so we have inborn or acquired and the more somatic autonomic reflex categories. First, reflexes can be classified based on whether they're inborn or acquired. Inborn reflexes are referred to as innate reflexes. These reflexes are formed through neural connections arising during fetal development, the neural part of fetal development. Reflexes formed through these neural connections are involuntary. We don't think about them at all. Examples include staying upright or getting the signal to use the restroom. Another type of innate or inborn reflex may occur if we're walking barefoot on the beach and step on a broken piece of glass, maybe a broken shell. Before the shard of glass or shell breaks through our skin, we've already pulled our foot up and away from danger. And it's only then after the danger is gone that our brain seems to catch up to the movement and we realize what's happened. The lower central nervous system has regulated this simple type of reflex, skirting the brain entirely. More complex learned reflexes are what we call acquired reflexes. And these types of reflexes are learned and are enhanced by repetition. A common example of a learned or acquired reflex is slamming on the brakes while driving a car when something is in the road in front of us, like a deer or a rock. 
or maybe we make quick adjustments to our driving as the light turns yellow. We should certainly slow down, though some people speed up. Reflexes can also be categorized based on function, and so this is the idea of somatic versus autonomic. With somatic reflexes, we rely on activating skeletal muscles, and so some of those things I've already provided. The autonomic or visceral reflexes, or visceral reflexes, we're going to activate smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, or glands. And the classic example of the autonomic reflex is shining a light into the pupils and watching for pupil constriction in both eyes, even if only one eye is exposed to the light. Ultimately, this is all I want you to know about reflexes. I want you to know the five components as well as the two ways by which reflexes can be classified, either as inborn or acquired, or as somatic or autonomic. And so here we've concluded another week's study of the nervous system. Next week, we'll come back to look at chapter 14 and the autonomic nervous system. Meanwhile, if you have questions, come visit me during office hours or set up an appointment outside of office hours where we can discuss your concerns. Between now and then, make it a great week, everyone.